Hello folks and welcome to English 280 Understanding Video Games. I'm your professor, Dr. Barton, and in this lecture we'll be briefly covering the course, give you an idea of what you can expect, uh, why you might want to take this course, what you can get out of the course, and all that good stuff. So let's just jump right in. And I want to start with a question for you. So why do you want to study video games. Now, so take a minute to ponder on that, answer the question. You don't have to go on for too long, but just give me some, give me some insights into why you want to take the course and then uh, come back and we'll resume. All right, so you may have answered the question in one of these ways, and these are all very good answers, so congratulations if you came to this idea. Uh, one is that Uh, video games are worth studying because they're so ubiquitous. They're, they're everywhere. People are playing them everywhere. It's a, kind of a big deal, uh, if you will. Uh, people play more games and watch television, watch movies. Uh, got some statistics here for you. This is from Jane McGonigal, who wrote a great book about called Reality is Broken, basically looking at ways we can use video games in uh, other scenarios, like to teach people how to... Uh, you know, how to learn things or simulate work environments and so on. But anyway, she says we spend three billion hours per week as a society playing uh, video games. So <laughs> try to wrap your head around that. That's probably way more time than we spend doing uh, pretty much anything else. Uh, hopefully you spend more time playing games and watching lectures like this one, but uh, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> uh, despite the gamer stereotype of the adolescent male, there are gamers of all genders, races, ages and creeds. So we still see this anytime on the news they mention well, gamer, you know, and they show this kind of photo of the uh, sort of uh, younger uh, white guy, a little bit nerdy for lack of a better word, uh, socially awkward, you know, all these sort of stereotypes are unfortunately still with us, but it's just not true. Yeah, I mean, sure, there are people like that uh, who enjoy games, but also many other types of people. Uh, and I probably don't have to tell you this, <laughs> a lot of people, their moms and grandmothers play as many games as they do. At least that's the, uh, the case for me. Uh, same thing with uh, all these other factors here. So it's definitely not, it's a phenomenon that's truly cultural-wide. Uh, also, video games are not just limited to consoles. Uh, so for many, many years, uh, people kind of assumed a video game was something you played on a Nintendo or an Xbox. And if you didn't have one of those devices, you weren't really a gamer. Uh, nowadays, again, this just isn't true. Angry Birds played a large role in this, actually, but people are playing uh, games on not just a dedicated gaming device, but their smartphone, uh, whether that's an iPhone, an Android, whatever. A lot of games are played on websites. Increasingly, games are played on televisions. Uh, Netflix rolled out a pretty interesting series of games recently with, uh, I was playing one with Bear Grylls. Uh, so if you know the Bear Grylls Man vs. Wild show, Uh, this was a game on, it's just like you're watching a Netflix video, but every now and then Bear would turn to the audience and say something like, well, what do I do? Do I eat the snake? <laughs> do I leave the snake alone? <laughs> you know, and go left on your uh, remote control if you want me to eat the snake. Go right if you want me to just leave the snake alone, right? So you'd be like, <laughs> eat the snake. Come on, it's Bear Grylls. <laughs> you want know, to see something gross? <laughs> uh, uh, so really, these games are everywhere. Uh, my friend Bill the Judas likes to say that any device that's capable of having a game on it will have a game on it. So you see games for uh, all kinds of calculators will have games, video cameras, basically anything with enough functionality <laughs> to have a game will have a game. So that's a good answer. That They're everywhere. Uh, something this important to our society probably should be studied. You know, that's just common sense. Uh, another answer is uh, the money. Uh, this is a big business, a lot of uh, careers, a lot of profits to be made. Uh, here's just a absolutely mind-blowing uh, statistic here. So video games, of course, growing. Uh, that's great news. A lot of uh, industries aren't growing, but this is one that's just growing every year, just incredible growth. Uh, look at this, $152 billion dollars in 2019. So you think about all the people playing games all over the world, You know, what a tiny, even a tiny slice of that $152 billion uh, would make you a very wealthy person, right? So this is, you know, and obviously there's a lot of interest in anything with this much money involved. 
you know, it really gets the gaming on the radar. Uh, there's some statistics there about the game Pokemon. This is a franchise, not just one particular Pokemon game. But my guess is you've probably heard of Pokemon. Uh, that franchise has amassed $17 billion. That's not, it. That's not including the merchandise, the plush animals, <laughs> just the games, $17 billion. Now, by comparison, Avengers Endgame, uh, which is considered one of the biggest movies of all time, I mean, it was enormous for Hollywood. That, only, that was only $2.79 billion. Uh, so you, I don't know if you factor in maybe all the Avengers movies that might get a little closer to Pokemon, but my guess is it would still fall short. Uh, and in Minnesota alone, there are 45, so almost 50 game companies, maybe 50 by the time of making this video. And just in Minnesota, okay, uh, gaming is a $43 million business, and it's growing. And I'll show you some links there if you want to get learn more about the Minnesota side of this, but... You know, you don't have to this you don't have to go to California or New York City, <laughs> someplace like that to make games. You can do it right here in Minnesota. So that's very appealing uh, for people who don't want to have to travel and move far away from their families. Uh, so let's learn a bit more about these opportunities. So I'll put a link here to something called Glitch. G-L-I-T-C-H dot M N for Minnesota. Uh, so click the link there, you know, scan the website and then come answer the question there. Uh, so what is Glitch? Now, what does this offer that may be useful for an aspiring game industry, industry professional? Uh, so I'll let you, you know, tell me what this is. I'm not going to tell you. Just explore it, learn about it, report, and then come back. All right, so moving on then. Uh, we want to talk a little bit here about game studies. What is game studies? <laughs> it's an academic field. Uh, so that makes it sound a little boring maybe, but it's pretty cool stuff what they're doing here. And the idea is we have all these different fields. English is a field. Within English we have literature, we have rhetoric, technical communication, and so on. We have fields of <laughs> biology, fields of physics. Uh, think about computer science, but there's also all these uh, other fields related to computers. Uh, so it's basically just these communities of uh, professors and scholars and researchers uh, that coalesce around a topic, right? And it's called an academic field if it has these things. So dedicated conferences you can go to, you can hear papers, you can hear research. Uh, there's also peer-reviewed journals, so you can read about uh, the latest studies, and these are professionally done studies with uh, checks and balances. Uh, that's the peer-review system. Uh, there's some kind of degree program, so you can major in biology. You know, this is not a big, this is not news to anybody. You could major in physics. You could major in nursing. You know, there's all these uh, programs, uh, but you could imagine what if they didn't have programs like that? You know, wouldn't really you couldn't really call it an academic field because it's not part of the academy, right? Uh, so and, uh, games are becoming like this now. Uh, so increasingly, you can not just take a course in games, but you can actually major in game studies. That is a thing. It's happening uh, all over. It's kind of cutting edge stuff right now. Uh, there's even PhD programs, so you could be like a doctor of game studies if you like. Uh, so these, this is all evidence this field is happening, it's new, it's sort of hot and trendy. And so it's a pretty cool thing to be getting in on at this time. It's, it's really great to get in on things when they're new, uh, before things, ever, you know, everything gets solidified, because uh, that's when you have the most room to, you know, the most flexibility. Also the most potential to make an impact yourself. Uh, so here's another question for you, question number three, I think, at this point. So learning more about game studies, what does this look like? You know, I don't know what kind of picture you have in your head of what game study scholars do, uh, but be that as it may, I want you to go to this site. It's uh, gamestudies.org. It's what I consider to be the flagship game studies uh, journal, academic journal in the field. Uh, they do, uh, I don't know if the issues come out maybe three or four times a year, I don't I don't know what the schedule is, but anyway, you can see all the, you can see the current articles. You can also go back in time and look at previous years. Uh, just take a look at some of the articles. Make sure you're not just looking at like an editorial. You know, dig in there a little bit, find some of the, the studies, and then answer these questions about those studies. Uh, you don't have to read the whole art, a whole article. Just try to get the gist of it. Uh, so, what are the kinds? Uh, what kinds of subjects and topics are they concerned with? Uh, what are they looking at, basically? What are they talking about? 
Uh, two, what kind of arguments are they making? Uh, so if they're writing, if the article is about, I saw one just a while ago about, uh, I think I did see one about Pokemon. Okay, they're talking about Pokemon. Okay, what are they saying about it? What kind of point are they trying to make in this article? Let's see if you can figure that out. Uh, and then three, what kind of evidence are they using to support those arguments? So they have they done this sort of scientific study? Have they just played the game and they're making, giving some examples of what to support their points? Uh, had they done a case study, so they gathered together some Pokemon players and talked to them, and maybe there was a survey, or, or maybe it's just a logical, logical reasoning. So they're kind of look, maybe looking at the rules of the game and talking about it in almost like a philosophical sense. Uh, I don't know. You know, th these articles. I'm not even going to tell you uh, what it's likely to be. So just take a look at that. And again, if you don't, if you can't answer these questions, if you're confused about them, uh, that's fine. Uh, but I just want to give you some exposure to what <laughs> you're getting yourself into. All right, then a little bit about me. Uh, who is this guy <laughs> teaching this course? <laughs> what do you know about games? You know, this is, you know, I don't like to brag, or I don't know if this is bragging or not, but I, I, I am concerned about people who, and I've run into people who claim to be game studies scholars, researchers, and you talk to them and you find out they've never actually played any games. <laughs> and they say, it's not important for me to play games. I just, you know, I'm applying my uh, theoret theoretical apparatus to this topic that I've, you know, never know anything about. It's really weird to me. It's like a literature professor who's never read <laughs> the literature, <laughs> you know, that they're teaching. Or a like a film studies scholar that hadn't seen any films, you know, you'd be really like, what the heck? Uh, so I think that's kind of weird. Uh, but anyway, you don't have to worry about that with me. Uh, I am definitely the real, <laughs> uh, for good or ill, I'm the real deal. been playing games my whole life. Uh, professionally, I've been a professor here at SESU since 2005. I am in the English department, but as you can see, we do all kinds of fun stuff here in English, including <laughs> now game studies courses. Uh, I've written six, six books on the topic. Some of these are... Yeah, some of these are second edition, so I include those as well. But you can see I've done a lot of books. Really, my specialty is uh, the computer role-playing game. And so if you like Ultima, Skyrim, uh, more recently the Witcher series. And there's some recent examples. Pillars of Eternity. And so I, I love that genre. I actually like to make my own games in that genre. It's kind of where I live. Uh, so, But I've, I've done books on other topics as well. Just video game consoles, vintage games consoles. We'll talk about like... A Nintendo, Atari, Coleco, uh, where did all these come from? What's the history there? And so I've written about that, as well as the big games, the really definitive games, Super Mario, Tomb Raider, Grand Theft Auto. Like, what's the big deal about Grand Theft Auto? Uh, what's the big deal about The Sims? You know, how did these games have such an impact? What was it about them? Uh, how did they come about? Who, who made those games? You know, I get into all that stuff in these books. And so I think it's, you know, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, working on these uh, books. Of course, do a lot of articles uh, for magazines. I've uh, done some journal articles as well. If you look in that Game Studies, you might even find an article by <laughs> Matt Barton. <laughs> I did many years ago for them. Uh, in addition to these books, I do a YouTube show uh, called Matt Chat. I've been doing that, I guess, I think over, I think about 11 years now. It's amazing. Uh, that started off as a project spun off of this Dungeons and Desktops book. And I've been interviewing all kinds of uh, industry professionals, developers. You know, I talked to uh, people that you, you may have heard of if you're into games. I talked to the uh, the Tetris, the inventor of Tetris, uh, Pajitnov. Uh, I've talked to people that made Doom. I've talked to a lot of the folks who made uh, the Obsidian games. And if you've uh, you know, there's so many of those, like the Fallout series. I've talked to a lot of those folks. Uh, I've talked to uh, a lot of folks related to uh, Star Wars, <laughs> Star Wars games. So it's kind of just all over the place. You know, I've, I've had a lot of uh, big names on there. Uh, Lord British of Ultima, uh, Brian Fargo. Uh, so, you know, you can. I certainly encourage you to watch those. You can learn a lot by listening to professional game developers talk about you know, what do they do? How do they get into this business? What is their philosophy about making games? You know, how did this guy come up with Tetris? What was going on uh, for that to happen? So we really get into that on the show. And it's been a 
pretty big deal for me. It's got 19,000 subscribers, getting pretty close to 20,000, and over 3 million views on that, which I just kind of, uh, I don't know what to make of that. It's kind of weird. <laughs> uh, but that's an example there. You know, like this book talks about, uh, which this is the textbook, by the way. You know, they talk about how game studies, one thing that's cool about it is it's not like you got the professors over here and the people making the games over here and they never talk to each other. Uh, it's not like that at all. We really, it's kind of a big community. So the game, people making games are part of this game studies movement, uh, which is really cool. You don't see that in a lot of other fields. Okay, that's enough about me. What about the course? I got three slides here on this. Uh, so really my goal here is for you to learn things you can use. If you do want to go into the games industry, fine, you're going to get some good stuff uh, that will help you. You'll learn a lot about it. Uh, but I, don't, I realize not everybody taking this course wants to do this for a living. So I've tried to design assignments and readings and subjects where it will be useful even if you don't go into games. So it could just be general writing skills, general research, analysis, uh, learning uh, some social stuff, some cultural theory. Uh, that will be useful. Learning also just about how software works, technology. Uh, we're not really going to get heavy into coding in this course, but we will get enough into it to where I think you'll begin to see some of the potential, uh, whether it's something for you. And just being a little bit more literate in the ways of software, I think, is, is helpful for everybody. You know, this is uh, 2020. <laughs> so I'm writing this <laughs> dawn of the new decade. And I, you know, I feel like we all are kind of technological and we need to uh, just embrace that and quit you know, trying to avoid it. It's actually really cool and fun. Okay, a couple other things about the course. Uh, what kind of work will you be doing? Uh, we'll mostly be doing a lot of reading and playing, obviously, of games. Uh, the main book of the course is, again, this one, Understanding Video Games, uh, The Essential Introduction. And this, like a lot of game studies, most of these folks, I believe, are from the Netherlands or Sweden. Uh, for some reason, uh, Eastern Europe uh, tends to get a, that seems to be the hub right now of game studies. A lot of great stuff coming out of there, as you'll see. Uh, but we'll be reading the chapters there. They're not especially difficult chapters. I actually think you'll love the, the chapters. A lot of great screenshots and things. You'll probably be like, oh, I remember this. Uh, but you're, now you're learning about it from an academic perspective, which is also really cool. Uh, so we'll be reading the chapters, and then you'll have some questions from the book to answer on D2L. Uh, and we can discuss, you'll be discussing those questions with your classmates. Uh, two, obviously we'll be doing this a lot, watching lectures like this. I'll try to have a lecture about each of the chapters. Uh, and then I'll put some questions in there for you, just be you and me on Edpuzzle. Uh, and then three, this is probably the bulk of the work, will be... Can you call it work? I don't know. <laughs> uh, playing a lot of video games. And I've picked the games that were, they received the most awards and got the most attention for having really good narratives or stories. Uh, so that's what, that's the reason I picked these games. They're, e they're either really good stories or they're doing something really interesting with stories. Uh, but it's got something, it's making, it's doing something interesting in terms of narrative and gameplay experience. So that's why I picked those. And you'll be writing these essays, and we'll talk more about how to write these essays, what I'll be looking for in those. Uh, but these will be short, one per episode or one per game. Uh, and then there'll be some peer review, and you'll be reading other students' essays. And again, a lot of collaboration there. And then finally, we'll be learning and designing a game of our own a product called Twine. And again, in the spirit of picking a tool that will be useful no matter what. Uh, so what I like about Twine is that, first of all, if you haven't heard of this, you've probably seen some of the games. If you've ever played a visual novel uh, or seen those choose-your-own-adventure books, you know, if you want to go here, go here. Uh, or if you've played a game where there's a dialogue system and you'll have a, maybe you're talking to a character and there'll be some options there like, what do you want to say? Do you want to say this, this, or this? Uh, you pick an option and then depending on what you say, they respond back. Uh, so all of that kind of logic is what Twine uh, where Twine comes into play. And a lot of uh, professional, just finished, I uh, just interviewed somebody, and she was telling me that this is a big deal in the games industry. They use Twine, the writers do, to figure out how the dialogues will work. Uh, of course, later on, they bring it into Skyrim or whatever the system is. But it's very useful for prototyping those conversations. Uh, so this is a tool that, you know, if you do want to go into game 
the games industry professionally, they'll know what you're talking about when you say you can use Twine. Uh, so that's really cool. Uh, but it's also really easy for people who don't know coding and programming to pick this up, start making games with it, uh, which is another reason I like it. And then finally, it's mostly writing-based. And so I'm a writing professor. I do English, so <laughs> obviously this is kind of my home turf. <laughs> I know a lot more about writing than I do about graphics and artwork and music and all that sort of thing. So it's, it's kind of in my wheelhouse, and I think it's a nice fit for an English course uh, about games. So that, I think we'll have a lot of fun with this. But again, the stuff you learn with Twine will be applicable. If you want to go on and do Python or C Sharp or Unity or whatever, the, Unreal, whatever the case may be, uh, the stuff will apply. And then finally, I know you want to know about what games we'll be playing in this class. And it looks like my list got a little bit messed up there. Uh, but we're looking at six games. Uh, the fr and I don't know particularly what the order will be for all of these yet. I'm still trying to decide some of this stuff. Uh, hopefully by the time this is posted, the list will be there. But this is what we'll be doing. Life is Strange. Uh, that's a game. It's an adventure game uh, that came out. Oh, when did this come out? <laughs> I should have written this down. <laughs> uh, but anyway, not so many years ago. And it got a lot of attention for its narrative. People are still, if you look, if you just type in like game narrative into Google, Life is Strange pops up. It's like the number one game. And there's a sequel out now. But we'll be looking at the first one. And it's broken into episodes, which is great for a course because you don't have to, you know, some games take like 100 hours to complete. Uh, these are episodes that take about an hour each episode, hour and a half maybe. So we'll be playing those. I think you'll uh, really enjoy that. But it's a very deep story. You know, I've taught this game in other classes and, you know, it's really, people get emotionally invested in this. Uh, so I think you'll uh, enjoy that. We'll also be looking at Undertale. Very different looking game. And it's a very, uh, you know, that one's made by just one person. Very sort of indie project, if you will. But it's got, does some really interesting things in terms of gameplay and narrative. Uh, I'll also be looking at some, and some of these I haven't, you know, played myself. So I'll put some games on here where it would be, you know, I'd be in there with you <laughs> learning about the game, too. Uh, one of those is called Firewatch, and I've been reading about this, and I'm really excited about it. I think it will be uh, pretty cool, again, in terms of, like, what are they doing with the story? How does the character relate to the action? Uh, Gone, ho Gone Home, uh, The Stanley Parable, and Night in the Woods are the other options there. And I, won't, I don't see any re real reason to go into great detail on each of these right now. Uh, if you want to look at them early, you can go to Steam, just type in the names of these games, get a look at it, see what we'll be, be doing. But all of these games, uh, they, they're overwhelmingly positive reviews <laughs> for what that's worth, uh, but really getting a lot of attention for their narrative. So I think it'd be well worth looking at these games and thinking about what makes, not just what makes them popular, uh, but how do they work? You know, what, what kind of mechanics are they using? Okay, that'll be enough, I think, for this introductory lecture. Uh, so what I'd like you to do is ask a question, make a comment, uh, just type something in there. Now let me hear from you what your thoughts are at this point. Uh, but anyway, I appreciate you uh, watching this, and I'll see you next time.